of the Bible, God in the gospel, hope seen in Jesus, hope yet to come. You are our center, daylight or darkness, freedom or prison, you are our home. Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise, God always faithful, you do not change. Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise, God always faithful, you do not change. God in our struggles, God in our hunger, suffering with us, taking our part. Still you empower us, Mother in spirit, feeding, sustaining from your own. Birthing new systems, lighting new Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise, God always faithful, you do not change. Welcome back, you beautiful people, and welcome to worship on this Sunday, May 30th, or whenever it is that you are joining us in this sacred space for worship today. It is ordinary time, the season after Pentecost. And let us begin the season of our church year finding the sacred, seeking the holy in our regular, everyday, ordinary lives. We will continue this week and next week during our worship and Kids' Corner time, exploring the parables of Jesus. Today in worship, we will consider the parable of the woman and the lost coin, as well as the parable of the man and the lost son. 
In Kids Corner today, we'll focus on the parable of the lost coin, and we'll have a craft to remind us of this story of Jesus. I want to take a minute to say that we so appreciate your commitment and your dedication to participating in worship as these in-person COVID restrictions continue on these 15 months later. We so deeply cherish your support. We appreciate your patience. As of the most recent updates, it seems that we here in Alberta can be cautiously optimistic and hopeful that the end is surely in sight. And thank God for medical science, for frontline and healthcare workers who have been working so hard to get us through this. In the meantime, we will continue to meet in this sacred virtual space and continue to look forward to when we can be safely together again in person for worship. So that being said, let us carry on. Let us hear the words of scripture, reflect, sing, and pray, and bless ourselves as we go out into the rest of our week. Let's start off by hearing our very first parable, read to us by Richard. Luke 15, the parable of the lost coin. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Following the parable of the lost sheep, we find the parable of the woman and the lost coin. Upon realizing the loss of her coin, the woman becomes frantic, turning on the lights, looking all over the house. She looks under the rug, looks at every square inch of her house until she finds the coin that was lost. She's so happy, she calls all of her friends and neighbors together to celebrate with her. And this, Jesus tells us, is the same joy of God for every person who chooses to let go of those things holding them back from embracing the fullness of God. Which might lead us to a question. When we spent time looking at the parables teaching us about the realm of God, that the realm of God is like a mustard seed, like yeast, like hidden treasure, like a fine pearl, like a fishing net. And we've heard stories about lost things being found. We remember surely the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin that we heard today. All inanimate objects, minus the sheep that innocently wanders off and gets lost. But what of human choice? What does this say for people who make conscious decisions to engage in destructive behaviors? What if people prone to err, and usually not on the side of caution, on the side of what is right and good? It's almost as though Jesus has been building to this question. In our next reading, we hear Jesus telling another story this morning about a man who had two sons. And now Heather will share this parable with us. Reading from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. The parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. 
Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But when he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Thank you, Heather, for sharing that story with us. So the story begins with the younger son asking for his share of his father's inheritance. And we don't need to be a part of first century Jewish culture to know that this is a deeply, deeply offensive request. The same as the son saying, Dad, I wish you were dead so I could have my half of what's yours. A man has two sons and one says to his father, I wish you were dead. What a strange way to begin a story. What's even weirder is that the father grants the request and says yes. The son leaves with all of his money, he spends it all, and in his humiliation and in his poverty, the son decides to head home, where he hopes that his dad will hire him on as a servant. But when he gets home, he isn't shunned and he isn't punished or treated as a servant. We hear that the father rushes out to welcome and embrace his son and then throws a huge party celebrating his return. Normally for an occasion such as this, culturally at the time, a lamb would be sacrificed for the meal, enough for the whole family. This father, on the other hand, calls for a calf to be prepared, enough for an entire village. How strange. As Rob Bell points out, it's almost like the son's actions were so destructive that he needs to be reconciled with the whole community, not just his father, not just his family. We commonly refer to this story as the prodigal son, as though this is where the story ends. That the story ends here, the son that was lost has now been found. We can almost hear Amazing Grace playing as we pan out on the scene. There are, however, a few points that I'd like to make here. First of all, Jesus begins this story with, there was a man who had two sons. We find after the wayward son returns home, the celebration infuriates the other son, the son who didn't leave, the son who worked hard, the son who respected and loved his father. Enough is enough. He refuses to join the party, instead arguing about the injustice of it all to his father, who responds in desperation. My son, you have always been with me and everything I have is yours, but now is the time to celebrate. Your brother was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. How interesting, I guess? The cliffhanger ending, the part that we don't usually think about when we think about this story, is about 
the good son, the one who stayed, remained faithful to his father, who's being begged to join the celebration. So what's all this about? Here's what we do know, more or less. For those of you more than familiar with the historical context of this story, it can take three minutes to quietly think about what you're going to have for lunch or supper later, but check back in after when you're done thinking about other things. Most readings of this parable focus on the flight and the groveling return of the brother, which misses the central point of the story, that each brother reflects a different way to be alienated from God and a different way to seek acceptance. The author of the book of Luke tells us that there are two groups of people who come out to listen to Jesus. First, there are the tax collectors and the sinners represented by the younger brother. They didn't observe biblical laws or the rules of ritual purity followed by the religious folk. They left home, so to speak, for wayward living. The second group were the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, represented by the older brother. They did everything right. They remained faithful to the religious teachings. They prayed all the time. They're reflected in this older brother. We're told by the author that all of these wayward sinners were flocking to Jesus, while the religious elite grumbled. This man welcomes sinners and even eats with them, they complained. Here, in this culture, to sit and eat with someone was a sign of acceptance. How can Jesus be proclaiming truth if he is welcoming and accepting those whose choices and behaviors are just oh so terrible? The thing with this parable is, it's very easy for us to get sentimental about it, hearing about God's unconditional love and acceptance of those sinners who eventually return home. But this isn't really the takeaway of Jesus' story. This is a story for the religious ones, and their hearts were not warmed in its telling. They did not weep for the abundant compassion overflowing from this God of radical love. They were offended. They were insulted. They were shocked. Few, if any, of Jesus' stories were intended to make us feel warm and fuzzy. The stories of Jesus were about tearing down walls and touching the lives of those whom society has rejected and marginalized. His stories were intended to turn over those metaphorical tables and often challenged the moral elite who went to church every day. This story certainly addresses the younger brother's selfishness, but it also condemns the older brother's moralistic ego. To be fair, in many ways, it would make us feel better to find ourselves in the wild younger brother Unfortunately, I wonder if Jesus speaks to us the way the Father speaks to the older brother. I wonder if there are times when, even for us, law, rule, tradition, the way we've always done it before, the kind of people we're used to are who we want in our pews, trumps, no pun intended, compassion, love, and openness. Timothy Keller wrote a wonderful book completely about this parable. He suggests that Jesus does not divide the world into the moral good guys and bad guys. Even though both sons are in the wrong, they are both loved. They're both cared for, invited to share in love and to share in a feast. A feast which means acceptance. Jesus' message, the gospel, is a completely different spirituality. The gospel of Jesus is not religion or irreligion, morality or immorality, moralism or relativism, conservatism or liberalism, and it's not the middle ground between poles either because it's something else entirely. 
The gospel of Jesus is distinct because everyone is in some way wrong and loved and called to recognize and change. By contrast, the brothers divide the world into two. The good people, like us, are the insiders, and the bad people who are the real problem and don't do things the way they should be done are the outsiders. And the younger brothers of the world, even if they don't believe in God at all, say, no, the open-minded and tolerant and accepting people are in, and the bigoted, narrow-minded people who are the real problem with the world, they are the outsiders. But Jesus says, Luke 18, 14, the humble are in, the proud are out, as in not getting it. The people who confess they aren't particularly good all the time or open-minded all the time are moving toward God because the prerequisite for experiencing the grace of God is knowing that we need it. In the case of this story, though, it seems that Jesus is suggesting that one is more dangerous. It's a bit ironic. The younger brother left the father literally, physically, morally. The older brother stayed home, but was actually more distant and alienated from the father because he was blind to his own true condition. Being an older brother Pharisee is a more dangerous spiritual condition. The Pharisees were so offended, but I'm always here every Sunday, every Sabbath, doing what God is calling us to do. No one had taught them anything like this before. When Jesus answered, that's not the point. Showing up for church, showing up at synagogue, that's not all there is. But all is not lost, for we are a Christian people and hope is our song and our story. Someone is certainly prodigal in this parable but I don't think that it's the son. I think it's the father. It's God, the mother of us all, who is prodigal. Prodigal is defined as recklessly extravagant. And in this context, how beautiful, recklessly extravagant is our God with love and grace. This prodigal God initiates contact, pleads, for reciprocation and seeks relationship. This prodigal God who recklessly, extravagantly, abundantly, joyfully loves and loves the wayward, the moralistic, the addicts, the self-serving, the lonely, the lost, the impoverished, the CEOs, the bartenders, the florists, the Hindus and the Christians, the unfaithful and the abused, the oppressed, the downtrodden, the athletes, the sick, the gossipers and the meek, the blended families and the differently abled, the First Nations, the transgendered, you and maybe even me. Cheap coins, you, me, it all results in the same. The recklessly extravagant, super abundant grace of God is for all of us. And for that, may we say hallelujah and amen.
friends in Christ, let us pray. Holy and gracious God, you, the one of prodigal grace overflowing with reckless abandon, we give you thanks for the gift of life abundant and for the blessings of this life for family and friends and love everlasting. Lead us through the trials, the suffering and sorrow, the challenges and struggles, the tired time, despair and bleak places back to you and love abundant. This past year has been filled with upheaval, loneliness, fear and uncertainty, yet you have not allowed us to walk this darkest valley alone. Be with those who weep or cannot sleep, who have no peace, who seek release, and comfort them with love abundant. Especially today, to you, our prodigal God, we pray for our beloved Gladys Cannon, who has experienced significant losses recently. Most recently, her son Duane, who passed away last week. Hold her and her family in your comforting arms, and may they experience the gift of your limitless grace. We take time now to offer to you the prayers that sit on our hearts this day. Holy One, Fill us to the brim with hope, sustained in your mercy, with patience and stamina upheld by your Holy Spirit in your prodigal grace. Transform us and all our broken ways. Transform us that we can be made whole. And in wholeness, may we be the hands and heart of Christ in this world, as we say those ancient words that he taught us to pray to you, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen.
friends, thank you so much for joining us for worship again this day. And as we leave this sacred space, may the extravagant love of God fill our hearts and our minds, and God's embrace hold us when we feel not good enough. May the friendship of Jesus, our companion, rid us of any idea that we are somehow unworthy. And may we find home with him in the realm of God, which is within each and every one of us. May the spirit of life release us from the heaviness of the darkest valleys so that a new joy wells up within us. Let us go and recreate the world in our friendships, in our workplaces, in our families, in our streets, and in our communities. Go and proclaim the stories of Jesus, serving in the name of the Creator and of the Redeemer and of the Sustainer of all life. Go in peace. Amen.